quay trở lại với kênh học em cùng ấy là bạn có thể dựa vào một số quy tắc về ngữ pháp để có thể đoán trước được trạng từ cần điền ví dụ sau độc từ chắc chắn là trạng từ trước danh từ chắc chắn là tính từ nếu các bạn nghiên cứu kỹ hơn một chút các bạn có thể hoàn toàn đoán được nội dung các từ còn thiếu nếu đầu tư nghiên cứu kỹ hơn một chút các bạn có thể đoán được trước một từ để điền vào trạng thái đừng chần chừ gì nữa hết tiếp tục Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all of your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test. You will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one of your booklet. Section one. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and a student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you rent apartments here? Yes, among other things. Are you looking to rent an apartment? Maybe, but I think I might actually be more interested in renting a house. Do you rent those as well? Yes, we do. Will you be renting alone? No, I have two friends that will live with me, but I'll be the primary renter. My friends don't have a source of income, which is kind of disappointing. But I do. I'm an artist, and I've already sold a number of paintings. I just moved to town to try to get more of my work shown. Oh, so you would like to be near the uptown area? That's where most of the galleries are, right? Yes, and there's a large area of homes only a couple of blocks away. Great. I don't have a car, so I prefer being within biking distance of the galleries. That would certainly be possible. Well. Let me see. There's a large four-bedroom house right off Main Street. That sounds good. I'd love to have extra rooms for my paintings. How much is it per month? Around nine hundred and fifty dollars. Ouch! That's too much for now. Do you have anything a bit cheaper? I have a three-bedroom that's for six hundred and fifty dollars. Hmm. That is definitely affordable. But I did want at least one extra room. Is there anything else with more rooms? Oh, here's another five bedroom that's vacant right now. It's further away, about a mile from the gallery area, but they're only asking eight hundred dollars. That's a deal for so much space. Well, a mile isn't so bad. It's only a five-minute bike ride, and that price is okay. I'd like to see that one. Can you give me the address? Sure. It's on one five six six Honeysuckle. H O N E Y S U C K L E Drive, Wood Heights. Now look at questions seven to ten. As the talk continues, answer questions seven to ten. Mm, such a lyrical street name. I like it. Is it furnished? Partially. It has a couch and chairs, a dining table, refrigerator and stove, a wardrobe, a couple of dresses and such, but no beds. Does it have a washer and dryer? It doesn't say here. But why don't you go and take a look? Here's a key. Just bring it back today before five. We'll do that. An hour or two later. Hi, you're back. How did you like it? A lot, but I know why it's listed so low. A couple of windows are broken, and they definitely need to be fixed. I'm surprised no one has broken into the house and taken anything. That should be fixed right away. No problem. I'll get a work crew out there today. 
That should be fixed even if you don't rent it yourselves. Did they have a washer and dryer? No, but I can wash clothes by hand until I find good used ones. There was another thing, though. The towels in the kitchen floor were broken and lying all over the place. You'd need to put in a new kitchen floor as well. OK, I'll talk about that with the landlord. If you can do those two things, then I'll take it as soon as you're ready. This is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear part of a radio program about do-it-yourself house painting. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly series on home improvements. Today's program is about do-it-yourself house painting. There's never been a better time for people who like to do their own interior house painting. Although people still lead very busy lives, Thanks to the availability of various new DIY materials, you can now decorate your home in a more efficient and a more environmentally friendly way. In 2009 alone, approximately 53 million litres of the paint that was sold in the UK were left untouched. That's enough to fill 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's easy to overestimate how much paint you'll need to decorate your room if you use guesswork. And if you know exactly how much paint is needed, you avoid unnecessary waste. There are automatic paint calculators available now. Most of the major paint manufacturers provide them. Look on their websites or just Google paint calculator and see what comes up. Then simply measure the circumference and height of the room in metres. Enter this into the calculator, along with the type of surface you're painting, and it will tell you how many litres of paint you'll need. But if you do end up with leftover paint, you can donate it to an organisation like Community Repaint. They will take the paint from you and redistribute it to local charities, and voluntary organisations, so it goes to a good home. You can find more information about Community Repaint on communityrepaint, all one word, dot org dot uk. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Another way of avoiding paint wastage is to check you're completely happy with your colour choice before starting to paint. For example, you can get a small sample of the colour you're thinking of using, then paint a board and move it around the room. 
so you can see how it looks against your furnishings and in different lights. Also, it's always better to buy high-quality paints because you get what you pay for. If you buy cheap paint, you might need to apply two or three coats to achieve the same coverage that you'd get from one coat of a good quality paint. You could also spend a week on a job that could have been done in a day or two. And consider the environment. Most paint manufacturers now sell water-based paints that don't contain harmful chemicals or give off harmful odours, so get one of these. You can also buy paint that's packaged in recyclable containers. There's a lot more choice than there used to be. You can only do a good job which will last if you prepare the surfaces thoroughly before painting. In fact, in many ways, if you want to do a professional looking job, this is more important than the painting itself. If there are any cracks or patches of loose plaster, Painting over them won't solve the problem. Take the plaster out and fill the holes, allowing enough time for the new plaster to dry. And you won't get a smooth finish if the walls are dusty or greasy, so washing with water isn't enough. Use a solution of decorator's soap and rinse well with warm water afterwards. When you're ready to paint, we suggest you use a medium pile roller for walls and ceilings. A lot of people tend to use short pile rollers, but these give a patchy finish, and that wastes paint and time. Similarly, long pile rollers can create a thick textured effect, which looks messy. The same goes for brushes. The stronger the bristles, the easier they are to wash and reuse. And as you've chosen a water-based paint, clean your brushes with cold water because it's more energy efficient that way. As you're decorating, keep transferring small amounts of paint into a tray and keep topping it up when you need to. This reduces the chance of it being contaminated by dust and pieces of dirt. And finally, water-based paint doesn't have a lingering smell, so that's not an issue anymore. But it's airflow rather than heat that helps the paint dry quicker. So, to help finish the job in the quickest time, leave your doors and windows open. The faster the paint is dry and the job finished, the quicker you can start enjoying your room. In tomorrow's program, I'll be giving some advice on... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear a tutor and a student talking about the history of the scientific method. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Simon. Come in. Take a seat. Now, I wanted to talk to you about your assignment. Yes, the one on the scientific method. That's right. I just wanted to see how you were getting on. Well, I think it's fine. I mean, 
I haven't done a huge amount of work on it because I've been working on other things, but what I've read so far seems fine. How many of the references that I gave you have you managed to get hold of? Not too many, I'm afraid. It seems that everyone else is working on the same things at the same time, and every time I look, the books are checked out from the library. Right. Well, I think that we can go over the main ground together now. That way, even if you don't manage to go through all the references in detail, you'll still have an overview. What has helped you most so far? I've managed to have a look at three of them. I thought that Johnson made some good points, but it was hard to follow the line of her argument. Bradman was simple and straightforward, and I felt as if I got a lot out of that. I wish I could say the same for Whitaker. To be honest, I didn't get very far with that. Okay, that's more or less what I'd expect. So tell me, what have you learned so far about the role of the Egyptians and the Babylonians? Yes, well, there's evidence that the basic components of the scientific method, examination, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis, were being used in the early 1600s BC, especially in the treatment of certain illness. Good. Yes, that's right. And the point, of course, is that that represented a considerable advance over relatively simple, non-empirical approaches, which usually attributed anything unknown to the actions of the gods, etc. Of course, the Egyptians and Babylonians did this as well, but what we see emerging here is a willingness to base opinion on systematic study of the real world, which is at the root of the scientific method. I see. Right, yes. And then that reappears later. Yes, although don't get carried away with the idea that it was a simple process of development. By the time we get to ancient Greece, let's take the period towards the middle of the 5th century BC, the rules governing the scientific method were practiced on a widespread scale, but there were still many people who believed that real truth could only be acquired by pure rational thought. Plato, of course, had a great influence on the development of the scientific method during this period. Through his academy. That's right. But then, as we know, a great deal of understanding of the scientific method disappeared as the old world order collapsed. It wasn't until the Middle Ages, sometime before the 11th century, that several versions of the scientific method emerged from the medieval Muslim world, all of which stressed the importance of experimentation in science. Right. I think I've got the historical timeline. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The other thing I'm struggling with slightly is actually pinning down precisely what we mean by the scientific method. I wonder if you could give me some pointers on that. Sure. Well, it's best to think of the scientific method as a series of steps in a process which allows us to find answers to questions about the world around us. So the first step is to identify the problem. What is it that you want to know or explain? And then I think the next step is designing an experiment. Hmm. But you can't design an experiment unless you know what you want your experiment to tell you. Oh, yes. You need to form a hypothesis to be tested before you design the experiment. So, there's a very clear relationship between hypothesis and experiment. Having designed the experiment, then of course you go on to carry out the experiment. The particular procedure you follow, the protocol, will differ from experiment to experiment, but the underlying principle is the same. 
you analyse the data from the experiment in order to confirm or disprove your hypothesis. Assuming the experiment is accurate. Oh, yes. If there's anything unusual about the data, or if the results are at all surprising, then you need to ask yourself whether the experiment could be flawed and whether the data could be unreliable. If the answer is yes, then it may be necessary to modify the experiment and go through the process again. So, once you have reliable, valid results... Then the final step is to communicate them. The wider scientific community needs to know about the results, and publication in journals is the accepted way. OK. I think I've got the basics. It's going to get more complicated as we begin to look at some people who have criticised the scientific method. So you need to make sure that you understand things up to this point. Let me know if you have any further problems with it. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on MSG. First, you have some time to read questions 32 to 41. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 32 to 41. You've probably noticed that MSG appears regularly among the ingredients of your favourite foods. But what is it? How long has it been used? How is it used? MSG, or monosodium glutamate, is a chemical commonly used to add flavour to salty or sour tasting foods. The average person knows almost nothing about it, but today MSG is found in everything from potato chips to soup. Its principal component is an amino acid called glutamic acid or glutamate. It was identified by Professor Kikune Aikida in 1908, but Eastern cooks have been using glutamate-rich seaweed as flavouring for more than 1,200 years. Glutamate is found in two forms. Bound glutamate, which is linked to other amino acids forming a protein molecule, and free glutamate, that has no link to protein. Only free glutamate is effective in enhancing the flavour of food. Foods often used for their flavouring qualities, such as tomatoes and mushrooms, have high levels of naturally occurring free glutamate. MSG is usually produced through fermentation of corn, sugar beets, or sugar cane. The finished product is a pure white crystal, which dissolves easily and blends well in many foods. Monosodium glutamate enhances the basic flavour of many foods. New studies also show that MSG elicits a unique taste that is known as umami in Japan and often described by Americans as a savoury, broth-like or meaty taste. Umami may be the fifth basic taste, beyond salty, sweet, sour and bitter. As an integral part of cuisines around the world, this savoury taste is common to the bouillons of Europe, the oyster sauce of China, the soy and fish sauces of Southeast Asia, the pizza of Italy and the chowders and stews of America. MSG helps bring out the best natural flavours in a variety of foods such as meat, poultry, seafood and vegetables. While MSG harmonises well with salty and sour tastes, it contributes little or nothing to sweet or bitter foods.
Results of taste panel studies indicate that a level of 0.1 to 0.8% MSG by weight in food provides optimum enhancement of the food's natural flavor. This is within the range of glutamate that naturally occurs in foods. Approximately one half teaspoon of MSG is an effective amount to enhance the flavor of a pound of meat or four to six servings of vegetables or soup. MSG is a self-limiting substance. Once the proper amount is used, adding more contributes little to food flavor. Overuse of MSG, as with many other seasonings and spices, may cause some foods to have an undesirable taste. There is simply no substitute for wholesome, quality food and good cooking techniques. MSG makes good quality food taste better, but will not improve the flavor of poor quality food. Disturbingly, scientists have known since the 1960s that MSG kills brain cells in young animals. Further research suggested that MSG may also be responsible for ailments ranging from skin rashes to irregular heartbeat and depression. Reports vary on just what percentage of the population is sensitive to MSG. One researcher put the figure as high as 30 percent, but food industry-sponsored studies have suggested it as low as one to two percent. Baby food manufacturers agreed to take MSG out of their products in the 1970s, but it is still widely used in other foods. This is because MSG is an economical way of stimulating great taste. If you're making a chicken stew but can't afford a whole chicken, why not use a little chicken and a lot of MSG? Consumer groups in the USA campaign regularly against its use. But for many of us, MSG will continue to be a part of everyday life. Food, it seems, will always be a matter of personal taste. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. với kỹ năng lịch sử hình các bạn cần thực hiện nhuận nguyên các chiến dịch đã được đề ra để tránh mất thời gian quý giá trong phòng thi hãy chuẩn bị thật tốt cho kỳ thi thăng hạng sắp tới bằng cách làm rõ các mẹo và luyện tập thường xuyên các bạn nhé các bạn còn những câu hỏi nào cần giải đáp hay không thì comment ngay để thực hiện